Want to know why? Ask how. Howard the Humongous. What the right likes to call the mainstream media is going apoplectic over Donald Trump's casual handling of foreign relations. But the critics may be wrong. And for once, Donald Trump may be right. Donald Trump is not even president yet, but he has held at least nine meetings and phone calls with the leaders of foreign nations. Normally, the Trump critics point out, a president calls in the foreign policy experts from the State Department before each call with a world leader. The president gets a briefing on all the geopolitical booby traps he should watch out for and gets an official set of talking points. But Donald Trump is skipping all of this. In the words of Daniel F. Feldman, a former special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan, quote, he's made himself not only a bull in a china shop, but a bull in a nuclear china shop. How is Trump making potential trouble? Our closest ally, our closest ally is England. A call with British Prime Minister Theresa May should have been one of the first Donald Trump made. But no, Trump didn't get around to British Prime Minister Theresa May until he talked to nine other world leaders. Nine others. That's an insult and a slight. Trump talked to the head of Pakistan before talking to Pakistan's arch enemy, India. Pakistani citizens hate the United States. And India's citizens often love us. Pakistan gets aid not just from the USA, it also gets huge amounts of aid from China. Plus, the Chinese are making a massive infrastructure investment in Pakistan for their next century super transport system, their new Silk Road. And the Pakistanis and Indians have fought at least one war. What's more, Pakistan has roughly 140 nuclear warheads. So things between the Pakistanis and the Indians are tense. Ah, getting lost on the page. Okay. Protocol says that Trump should have called India first, and he should have been aware of all the explosive issues involved. But no, without knowing it, Trump slighted India. He raised negative feelings and put India on edge unnecessarily, and India just happens to be one of the two biggest countries in the world with a population well over a billion. So Trump raised negative feelings and put India on edge totally unnecessarily. Then there are Trump's calls with dictators. The head of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, has held his position as the country's absolute master for 27 years. There is no democracy in Kazakhstan. The elections in which Nazarbayev is swept back to power over and over again have a peculiar tendency to support the dictator by 97.7%. In other words, Kazakhstan's elections are rigged. But Donald Trump praised this dictator for the quality of his leadership. The same sort of thing happened with the new head of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, who has encouraged his citizens to kill anyone accused of drug dealing in the streets without benefit of a trial, and his orders on this have been carried out. There have been many killings. Even if it's, un if it's, if, even if it's likely you're killing somebody, even if it's likely that that person has been accused, despite being innocent, he's been accused simply to settle old scores. In other words, Duterte is encouraging a vigilante society, the end of law and order. Trump had a schmoozy talk with this Philippine monster and invited him to the White House. And the list goes on, complete with a phone call with the head of Taiwan that made the Chinese apoplectic. They went crazy. Trump's conversations praising dictators for their leadership style makes folks like me, people who do not like Donald Trump, afraid that Donald Trump wants to follow the leadership example of one of the men he praises most, Vladimir Putin. They make people like me fear that Donald Trump wants to rig American elections and be president for life. 
But let me tell you a story of skipping normal diplomatic protocols and stressing person-to-person -person communications. It's the story of my relationship with the 11th President of India, Dr. APJ Kalam. Dr. Kalam and I were introduced through a friend in the military who had spent a year in India. The friend in the military put me in touch with an experienced Indian diplomat who then instructed me at length and for months about level one diplomacy, level two diplomacy, in other words, how to go through the elaborate and formal routines it takes to deal with a former head of state. I found those irksome. I had no time to waste. I wanted to get things done. So one day, when one of my new books came out, The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism, I felt that as a courtesy, I should send it to Dr. Kalam, even if it only ended up in his slush pile. And instead of going through level one and level two diplomacy to get the book to Dr. Kalam, I sent him an email and sent him the book personally. Dr. Kalam picked up the book at about four o'clock uh, on a Thursday afternoon. By 10.30 at night, he had done something that was totally against protocol. He had sent me a personal email with none of his staff involved, and at great length, he called the book a visionary creation, and he called me, <laughs> I know this is hard to believe, he called me a visionary. A couple of years, and I put, I put Dr. Kalam together with Buzz Aldrin, the three of us had a conference call on Skype, of all things. Several years later, Dr. Kalam came to the United States. He was in San Diego, and I was in San Diego for an, uh, an annual meeting of the National Space Society. Um, there were so many people who wanted to meet with Dr. Kalam that I didn't think that my presence was necessary. But I got a summons saying, Dr. Kalam wants to see you. Well, I went into a line that was like a line of candies in a Pez dispenser. Each person was shuffled to the elevators, put through security, sent up to Dr. Kalam's suite, and was given 15 minutes with Dr. Kalam. Then my turn came. I walked into the room of Dr. into Dr. Kalam's suite and saw him conversing with some very important people. I do not think that I'm a particularly important person. So I tried to shuffle myself to the side and sit in the room unobtrusively so I wouldn't interrupt this important conversation. While I was looking for a place to sit, Dr. Kalam's eyes met mine as if we had known each other since first grade. He stepped out of his group of important people, came over, and totally broke protocol. He gave me one of the biggest hugs I've ever gotten in my life. He dismissed the important people, and it turned out that he'd not scheduled me for the 15 minutes of the Pez dispenser. He'd scheduled me for the end of the day when his time was open-ended. So we sat and talked, and Dr. Kalam, who is, was a visionary, unfortunately dropped dead six months ago at the age of 83. But Dr. Kalam, this amazing man, obviously regarded me as some sort of a visionary personality. He pulled out a book to which he had just written the introduction, and he made me read the introduction in front of him so he could see the response on my face, so he could see if I felt he was as visionary as he felt I was. And in fact, my face lit up. I was astonished by what I read. Dr. Kalam really gets it about the big picture and the long-term view of where humanity has to go from here. I was floored. I was amazed. And he saw that in my face. When we finished the meeting, Dr. Kalam gave me three more hugs. All those hugs are against protocol, totally against protocol. Would Dr. Kalam and I have had the same kind of relationship if we had gone exclusively through official channels, if we had gone through all the elaborate rituals that are required by protocol, not on your life. So Donald Trump may be on to something here. Does anything positive come from Donald Trump's phone conversations? The head of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, declared recently that he was shredding his nation's 70-year-long military alliance with the United States and he was switching his allegiance to China. Um, in the process, he called Barack Obama a son of a whore. Definitely not diplomatic protocol. And he, ending a military alliance with us would have been very bad news. We rely on Japan and the Philippines to help us check China's aggressive expansion in the South and East China Seas. And thanks to Donald Trump's breezy, often ignorant approach to foreign leaders, Duterte and the Philippines seem to be friends with the USA once again. Maybe Donald Trump is on to something. This is Howard the Humongous speaking to you from the future. It's your job and my job 
to make or <laughs> want to know why, ask how. And now for the sleazy, slimy, sneaky little off button. <laughs>